My name is Andrew Harvey and I'm deeply excited and honored to be talking with a man that I admire enormously, someone who is one of the bravest pioneers of our time, Guy McPherson, a scientist and a spiritual being who understands that the whole world is now in extreme danger and who is bringing his message alongside the message of Carolyn Baker in a great new book called The Extinction Dialogues, which I had the honor to introduce. And I would just like to read the first two paragraphs of my introduction because they express better than I could now exactly what I feel about Guy's work and about this book that he did in collaboration with Carolyn Baker. No one who truly reads this book will ever be the same afterward. Whether you agree in the end with its drastic and shocking conclusions is of course up to you. The very fact that such a book outlining the case for the coming extinction of life on earth could be written at all and with such fearless clarity and compassion changes absolutely all serious conversation about our contemporary world crisis and our potential response to it. In Extinction Dialogue, Carolyn Baker and Guy McPherson tell us that overwhelmingly scientific evidence now makes it clear that our environment is headed for swift apocalyptic collapse and that this evidence now has to be faced and integrated into the deepest level of the psyche by all those human beings brave enough who want to face the unspeakable facts rather than be drugged by what Guy McPherson Riley calls hopium. The authors know from their own fierce experience that such integration is extremely costly and demands a capacity to weather unprecedented grief, depression, outrage and despair. The authors believe there is no way out of this extreme process. We can only be of help to each other in the end game of our world it will allow all our remaining illusions about human agency, fix-it solutions and magical thinking about divine intervention to be ruthlessly burned away in the furnace of truth. Well, <laughs> Guy, you've been ruthlessly burned away in the furnace of the truth that you've uncovered in your amazing scientific work. So what I would really love it now is if you would explain to us a little bit about who you are and what your journey to these devastating conclusions have been, has been. Yes, thank you, Andrew, and thank you for that, for reading this couple of paragraphs from an excellent forward. I'm Professor Emeritus at the University of Arizona. I, I actively worked there as a professor for 20 years, I had left active service in May 2009 to establish a homestead in southern New Mexico. I was a conservation biologist for my entire career. I have studied climate change since beginning my graduate work in 19, oh, the mid 1980s. I began graduate work in 1983. I started studying climate change with an emphasis on on the deep past initially and so I have studied climate change for more than 30 years now and and I'm a conservation biologist I'm I'm interested in the in, in conserving the the biology of the living planet even as industrial civilization drives 150 to 200 species to extinction every day so I began studying climate change a long time ago um, I reached the conclusion that we had triggered events likely to cause human extinction in the very near term. I reached that conclusion in 2002 when I was wow. editing a book on climate change. And What was it like for you to register that? It, it was absolutely devastating. And it was very confusing. Yes. I, 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 was, I was a pariah. People couldn't understand why would be concerned about all humans it, because you know their their mother or their grandmother or or their their aunt was dying and so that's what's important is the specific individuals we connect with and so 
So thinking about talking about the loss of all human beings seems so abstract that, that I couldn't even have a conversation with people about it because they couldn't understand why I would um, be concerned about something so abstract as human extinction when it was their grandmother who was dying. And, and I didn't seem to be particularly concerned about that. And no, I'm not particularly concerned about your 85-year-old grandmother who had this rich and wonderful life. And, and now she reaches the conclusion the natural end of every life is death. And so, yes, I'm concerned for you. Uh, I have empathy for you as a human being. But what I'm thinking about here is something at an at a unbelievable scale relative to a single individual at the end of a long and, and rich life. So, so it was very difficult to, commu to even communicate with people. It's very difficult now to communicate what you're discovering to people. What in 2002 led you to that conclusion? What were the facts that you found inescapable? Tell us those facts because so many people are in such confusion about the different states of contemporary environmental science. Well, it's a little embarrassing for a left-brained uber-scientist to admit, and that's exactly <laughs> where I was in 2002. That book was published in 2003. But the major editing was going on in 2002, and at the time I used intuition. The, the scientific facts were not in clear view. There was no clear evidence yet that we were headed for human extinction in the relatively near term. But there were little bits here and there about what industrial civilization was doing to the atmosphere of this, our only planet. And carbon dioxide emissions were high and rising. So it was, it, it was mostly intuition, and that's a little embarrassing for a scientist to admit. Um, but but there that are, intuition has been borne out, as you make very clear in Extinction Dialogues, with appalling facts, hasn't it, about, you, for example, the ways in which the feedback loops are working, the ways in which massive amounts of methane gas are being released. So it would be very helpful for us to know where you stand right now in 2015. Well, yes, and in 2002... When I was working on that book, I reached that conclusion, and then shortly thereafter, a year or two later, I discovered the concept of global peak oil, that is, that, that, that net energy would start to decline, and I, and I thought, well, here's the Hail Mary pass. This is what's going to save us. Industrial civilization will reach its overdue end, and therefore, we won't be able to continue to contaminate our atmosphere. And not to mention the extinction crisis and all those other things that go along with civilization. So I thought this was a savior, but, but clearly now it's too late for that because we have triggered more than four dozen self-reinforcing feedback loops. The most notable of those, methane coming out of the Arctic Ocean, um, according to Paul Beckwith, a scientist at the University of Ottawa in Canada, will cause the global average temperature of the Earth to rise five or six degrees centigrade within a decade or two. He reached that conclusion. Within a decade or two, five or six degrees. And what is the cutoff point for human life? Well, we've never had humans on the planet at 3.3 degrees centigrade or higher on the planet in the past. The, the maximum temperature humans have, in any form of humans, have, have been on this planet was at 3.2 degrees centigrade above the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, above what, what I'll call baseline from now on. So we're headed for 5 or 6C, interestingly. In 10 to 15 years, potentially. Well, in, in, in 10 to 20 years. And, <laughs> and you know, there's, there's, an, there's an article by Oliver Tekel for The Guardian in 2008 indicating that 4C means extinction. In fact, the title is at 4 degrees we all we can plan for is extinction or something like that as if there's some way to plan for human extinction um, so so we're headed for very rapidly a temperature rise beyond which humans have persisted and it's not because we're not clever we're very clever 
in, in fact, I think we've been misnamed. We, we named ourselves Homo sapiens, sapiens, wise, the wise apes. A better name might have been Homo calidus, the clever <laughs> apes. We're very <laughs> clever. And so it, it's not that we aren't clever. We are very clever. It's that our habitat for our species with such a rapid rise in temperature is almost certain to go away. As it is already, species are, are dropping like the proverbial flies because yeah. they cannot keep up with the profound swings in weather. The high temperatures and low temperatures coming so rapidly together are, are causing the elimination of dozens of species every year. Well, yes. we can't live without plants. You know, we or bees, or, or frogs, or right. any of the species that are being annihilated. Exactly. And, and the phytoplankton in the ocean, for example, um, which, because of ongoing acidification of the ocean, are in profound decline, and according to the refereed journal literature, could dis completely disappear because of uh, ongoing acidification. Well, that's right. half the food we eat. That's the base of the marine food web. We can't live without a living ocean. When you speak like this, and thank God you are being invited to speak all over the place and your work is becoming more and more recognized, what kinds of reactions do you have? Because whenever I bring up your work, I must say people get extremely angry with me, go into total denial, say that I'm trying to attack the very foundations of human decency, it is so hard to start a conversation about the unspeakable, isn't it? Yes, yes it is. And, and so I receive, in response to my, to my message, which really isn't my message, it's just connecting the dots from other scientists. I haven't conducted primary research for six years now. And so really I'm just accumulating this information that other scientists are putting out like Paul Beckwith, for example, and, and hundreds of articles now from the refereed journal literature pointing us down this, this wayward path. The response I received um, was, was clearly described by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in her Five Stages <laughs> of Grief. So almost always the first question I get is one of denial. Yes. Right? So the first comment or the first question is something like, no, that can't happen, that can't happen, that's, we're too clever, we'll find a way out, and, you know, the absolute denial. We'll find a technological solution, Obama will suddenly become Lincoln and transform the whole right. vision of the environment, etc. Endless magical formulae come up. Don't they? Right, right. And as pointed out in the Referee Journal literature, a paper by, by Tim Garrett, who's at the University of Utah, um, points out, written in 2007, published in 2009, and he's had a couple of follow-up papers that reinforce this point. Civilization is a heat engine in any form. So the only way to prevent runaway climate change, prevent runaway greenhouse, and remember this is from 2007, is to immediately cease all civilization. Well, we didn't stop in 2007. Since then, we've learned about those four dozen self-reinforcing feedback loops with respect to climate change, and most notably, methane coming out of the Arctic Ocean. It's pretty clear that methane released from the Arctic Ocean has gone exponential. Therefore, atmospheric methane at the global level has gone exponential. And so, let's, Paul back with point, Guy, because I speak about it, having been informed about it by you and other articles, and whenever I speak about it, people say, well, people are in very different moods about methane, they're different mm -hmm. facts. This is the endless response. What's the real skinny now, at this moment, about methane? Okay. So you bring up an excellent point, and in, in a, a, a little bit filling in to that answer I was giving a few minutes ago. The questions and the responses start with denial. Then they go to anger. There's lashing back. Yes. Then there's yes. negotiation. Then there's bargaining, right? Yes. As if nature is going to bargain. Yes. Yeah, as if we can, can somehow negotiate with nature and get the outcome. Sorry we devastated you completely. Sorry that we haven't paid any attention. Now I need you to turn up and help us and save us. Right. That's right. Exactly. Right. So here's what we know from the Arctic Ocean, from methane coming out of the Arctic Ocean at this point. It's his understanding of 
past events that leads Paul Beckwith to conclude in, in late November 2014 that methane coming out of the Arctic Ocean will cause a global average temperature rise of 5 or 6 degrees C within a decade or two. So he says that process is underway. And, and he proposes geoengineering to stop it, but there's oh. an abundance of refereed journal literature indicating that that's a disastrous, horrific idea. Oh. Uh, so I would argue that, that, that methane release is underway and is, has gone exponential, and there's nothing we can do about it. That's, that's bargaining that suggests that we can do something about it. Um, Paul Beckwith is the authority on Arctic Ocean methane, but he's relying on data that are quite clear that atmosp atmospheric methane over the, since 2007 has gone exponential. So, so the last stage is of Kubler-Ross's um, is acceptance. Isn't yes. It? And then you added one in our last conversation, yes. like, which is gallows humor. Yes, that's that right. You're a master of because <laughs> you, in the situation so extreme and unspeakable, we have to find resources of humor to deal with a situation that nobody wants to deal with. You must meet this all the time. Here you are presenting a very clear, very lucid, very formidably argued understanding of near extinction and how few people truly want to engage with it because it is a major assault on the human ego. We've never faced this before, never believed that we would face this before and here we are having created a situation in which we're committing mass suicide and destroying a great deal of the planet and that is almost impossible for the great majority of people even to begin to face. Well, right. Uh, you know, we, we are an exceptional species. We are one amongst millions of species, but we are an exceptional species in that we have these big brains that, yeah. that make us massive tool users. And so we think that can get us out of anything. I mean, yes. it was the 1700s when Thomas Malthus wrote about uh, population, population growth and, yeah. and, and, and the associated decline. And, well, that's more than 200 years ago. Look, that's no problem. We're going to work our way out of this. We're going to work our way out of everything, aren't we? Right. We're so brilliant, yes. Well, we always have. You know, recently yeah. there's a popular film that's been released that I haven't seen. But apparently the signature line of the film is, we'll find a way out. We always do. And that's, yes. that's sort of the human mentality and especially the American exceptionalism yes. conclusion that we Manifest are in fact... destiny, of course. Right, to yes. Right to the challenge we always have, we always will, rah, rah, rah. This is go. very hard for people to face. How, what happened to you inside you as you came to face the unspeakable? What did you go through? I was horribly depressed. Yeah. for several months and and then I, I discovered the the concept of net energy decline at the global level so I thought oh hallelujah here's the Hail Mary Pass and at the time I didn't really realize you have to remember this is more to, more than 10 years ago at the time I didn't realize that the termination of industrial civilization means the catastrophic uncontrolled meltdown of 400 and some nuclear power plants around the world and the 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 losing of all the water from the cooling ponds and so the 1200 uh, containers of spent fuel rods will explode and, and will have fires the likes of which this planet has never seen. I didn't really think that through and, and so that's the kind of outcome that Tim Garrett points toward when he says only collapse of industrial civilization prevents runaway climate change. It leads to this horribly catastrophic series of events at the nuclear facilities. I didn't even think about that, and still I was massively depressed. And and, and then I, I viewed, you, you know, peak oil as something as savior because I, so I became pretty optimistic for a while. But but then in mid 2012, the evidence overwhelmed me on the climate front. The number of self-reinforcing feedback loops and the magnitude of them came to be too much. So I was very depressed again. And and then I just pushed it away, like most Americans do. We're we're very much a grief denying culture. Yes. And so I pushed that away, and we have all these myths about grief in this culture. And then finally, 
In January of 2014, I went to a workshop put on by the Grief Recovery Institute and became a specialist in the grief recovery method. And within 20 minutes of there, I realized that what I was experiencing actually had a name. It's called grief. And there's a way to deal with that. There's, there are many ways to deal with that. And here's a path forward. Holy cow. Yes. What, what an eye-opener for me. I didn't I, even know what to call what I was going through. I knew that there was something terrible going on right here between my ears. But I couldn't even describe it. I knew that I was emotionally a wreck. But I didn't even know what to call that. And here within 20 minutes of this workshop, I had a name for it. And, and, a, and a set of tools to deal with it. And that was very exciting. And so within the last year or so, I've become a much different human being than I was even at the, at the ripe old age of 54. I, I'm, a, I'm a completely changed human being by that experience. And then two weeks later, a retreat at a Dharma center in Winnipeg put on by Lama Jerry Coppolo that that specifically was intended for me and uh, and several of his students to meditate on on what what this all means and and where we're going and and, and Jerry contacted me in October of 2013 and said I've been following your work for many years and you were angry and frustrated and lashing out and acting like a complete ass and, and by which I th I think he meant a complete People have said the same about me too. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. and then he said, "How can you not be angry when you finally face this? But you right. have to go beyond that, obviously." Exactly, and that was his point. That was the point of him contacting me. He said, "You put out this video shot by Pauline Schneider in October 2013, and I realized you had completed the Asuba meditations, and so good for you." And I thought, "Yay, good for me!" By the, <laughs> by the way, what's an Asuba meditation? <laughs> Because <laughs> I had no but idea. Pain, it's pain, but it is, I was largely unfamiliar with, with Buddhism <laughs> and what any of that means. And so he explained to me that the Asuba meditations are meditations on the repulsive or the most disgusting. And so his teacher had his students watch a human body decay over, over a span of, of many weeks. And so he told me, you've been watching the body for a long time. I think it's time we had a talk. And so I'd, I'd been looking at the repulsive for many years, and, and I came out the other side with this, this compassion and this kindness that, and, and this empathy that I didn't have when I was the uber scientist just pointing out the facts to people. And so those two events within the last year or so were quite pivotal to me getting to a much improved emotional and intellectual and, and spiritual space than I was not very long ago. One of the things that moves me very much when you speak about these things, and I first encountered you when I was sleepless in Australia one night, and turned on the TV and there you were talking to Tom Hartman and I was absolutely galvanized, not only by what you were saying and the facts that you were giving us so lucidly, but also by a quality in your response to the facts. The fact that you could, in the face of this unspeakable suffering and horror that you've unveiled, and I think magisterially so, remain humorous, remain compassionate, remain committed to helping at the deepest level. And you said something that night that struck me very deeply. You said that given the really deep possibility of near-term extinction, human beings have a deep sacred responsibility to be decent. What do you mean by that word decent and how does that decency unfold in your own vision? Well it's pretty interesting somebody who who's followed my work for a long time and I followed her work for a long time, Corey Morningstar, a Canadian uh, climate activist. Uh, I was talking to her within the last month or so on the telephone and she said I really hated you for a while. I, I, I did not like what you were saying, and I did not like the way you were saying it. And, and I agreed with people who said, you propose doing nothing. You propose inaction, even though I have never proposed inaction. You've never proposed inaction. This no. is not at all what you're proposing. Uh, of course not. But, but many people don't see that. And she said, I no. finally figured out 
that you are proposing doing something. You're proposing we be decent with each other. You're proposing we respect each other. You're proposing we be kind and compassionate to each other. That's not doing nothing. That's doing and something. And also kind and compassionate to the whole animal race. You're yes. saying fundamentally, if we've created this horrific situation, we have a responsibility to act on every single level as we face the truth of the situation, act with love and decency and compassion and resolution because that's the last thing as human beings we can truly hold ourselves to. Right. What better judge what better judge of our character than how we act against impossible odds? Exactly. And and these are truly impossible odds, as they've always been, by the way. All individuals die and all all species go extinct. Absolutely. So the time frame appears to be accelerated, but fundamentally the issue remains the same. I'm a conservation biologist. I knew a long time ago that humans would go extinct. I didn't know I would be part of the last, you know, that I would be here at the end of the show when I stumbled across conservation biology in the 1980s when really it was birthed in the, in the United States. Uh, but the fact is that all species go extinct, that all individuals die. What makes us think we're so special? We, there are some things that are truly inescapable. So given that, even if we have 100 years as individuals, should we not act as if, our lives matter and, and the lives of those around us, including on human species, of course we should. Of course we should. But you point to something that I think is very profound, and I'll try and explain it in my own terms and see if you can dance with me with this. There is a huge gift in this apocalyptic situation to us all, and that is that it makes absolutely clear the impermanence and precariousness of everything and bitch slaps the human ego finally and destroys all illusions. And that can lead to paralysis, despair, inertia, horror, or it can lead to a fundamental commitment to uncover inner divine consciousness and act from that with peace and joy and compassion, giving up the fruits of action, come what may. And that form of action is actually liberation. So there is a way in which this situation is the perfect cauldron for the liberation of the human race from its fantasies. We'll be born in our death. I, I couldn't agree more. And I went through all that. I went through the disgust and the fear and the and, and, and the whole and thing. The rage, the, the terrible yes. rage. Yes. Which so few people really allow themselves to experience. But it is an almost paralyzing rage, isn't it? A absolutely. And, and, and ourselves, at, at what the culture has allowed, at the whole systems of cold evil that are allowing this massive genocide of life to take place. And I was paralyzed, and many people, many people respond to my message with paralysis. Yes. You say, you've just taken everything away, and there's nothing I can do. I'm just going to lie in bed for the next month or until I die. And, and I challenge people to do that because um, our bladders just aren't big enough to lay in bed until we die. Well, inevitably, <laughs> you're going to have a massive depression. You're going to be heart shattered. You're going to be paralyzed because all of your tricks, all of your illusions about human agency are being taken away. But if you hang in there with a modicum of faith, I've found that the divine will guide you to a place in which you connect with your own inner divine consciousness at a much deeper level. You taste the deathlessness of your true self at a much deeper level. And slowly you find yourselves emerging as a new kind of human being, really committed to loving and serving whatever happens. Yes, and that brings and that's up that's a huge shift. That's an evolutionary shift, isn't it? Yes, that brings up a couple of very important points. I hope I hope people are shattered. Because yes. if they aren't, they must lack empathy completely. Well they're, if they're not, they're gonna miss this great opportunity. Right. This opportunity is the ultimate shattering. The ultimate shattering can lead to the Founding birth of new consciousness, whatever happens, if you're missing the shattering, you're missing the dance. Right, absolutely. And the second point you bring up is, and you've mentioned it a couple of times, no matter what happens. 
And I yeah. think that's absolutely right. No matter what happens, should we not pursue decency? Should we not pursue compassion? Should we, you know, independent of the outcome? And, and as I understand it, this is a central tenet of Buddhism, at least some of the traditions, is that we, we act in a certain way independent of the outcomes or without expectation of the outcome. Uh, it's the, the true from detached. all of the mystical systems, Guy. All of the great mystical systems say the same thing. Mm -hmm. The liberated being acts out of love and compassion for the sake of love and compassion alone, not out of a personal agenda. In fact, if you're close to liberation, you give up all agendas to the mystery of the divine intelligence. Mm -hmm. And you do what you do for the sake of doing it because you know that that's what keeps the truth alive in even impossible circumstances. The two examples that come to mind immediately to me, one is from classical Greece, and that's that amazing example of the, the Spartans at Thermopylae. They knew they were going to die. They didn't know that the Persians wouldn't overwhelm the Greeks, but they were Spartans, and they represented their Spartanhood by going out into that past and giving their lives up, because the one thing they wouldn't give up is their decent dignity. And the second example is something I think about a lot, the Warsaw Ghetto. There, were, there was absolutely no evidence that the Nazis at that time in the war were going to be defeated. Warsaw Ghetto was entirely surrounded, and yet a whole group of absolutely heroic people just stood up for human compassion and dignity and gave their lives to witness that. Mm -hmm. These are the kinds of examples that we need to draw on at this moment. Yes, and an important point about the Warsaw Ghetto, the survival rate of those who did not resist was zero. The survival right. rate of those who did resist was near zero, but it wasn't zero. There right. were a very few people who survived the, the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. And so resistance is within us, and yes. resisting this omnicidal dominant culture is bound to turn out better than going along with it. And even if we don't reverse, or it cannot be reversed, right. those who turn up in that spirit, those who give everything calmly, compassionately, humorously at this moment to represent human dignity, they will live a wholly different quality of life mm -hmm. as long as life exists on the planet. That's right. what I know. That's what I experience. That's what you experience. That's why I keep going all over the world to talk about sacred activism because it seems to me that the old vision of sacred activism as being what will change everything has to be shifted now to a vision of activism as the only force that can truly preserve human dignity, human decency, human compassion in the face of unspeakable suffering and disaster. Mm -hmm. So it becomes more important, in fact, to act in this paradoxical situation than ever. Absolutely. So, so I'll, I'll grant you paralysis temporarily, but then it's yeah. time to get up and act. Then it's time to get up and show your decency, to, to show what humans can be regardless of the outcome, regardless of the fact that you're going to die and that I'm going to die and that all of us are going to go extinct. Let's do it. What would you say to people who are going through that shattering now? Um, I, I speak to and with a lot of people as they go through that shattering and, yes. and I correspond with many, many more. And it's a difficult place to be. And so I, so I recommend a few tools. I point out the myths associated with grief in this culture. The, you know, that, that we should grieve alone, for example. Which, right. Which is nonsense. You know, we're the That's only culture so in history to ever promote the idea of grieving alone. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so find community, find people to go through this with you. Um, that, that time heals all wounds. No, it doesn't. No, it absolutely doesn't. If you, if you step on, on a, a, a railroad spike and, and you get a little piece of shrapnel, a little shard stuck in your foot, and then it heals over, it calluses over, but it continues to bring you pain for, for days, weeks, years even, how do you eliminate the pain? You go in and you root it out and you clean it out. You go deep. Time didn't heal that wound. 
You experience what does heal the wound? Going in there and washing out and exposing it to the light of day. And the same applies to our hearts, as, as to our physical bodies, to, our, to, to the foot that stepped on the railroad spike. The same thing applies to our hearts. Time doesn't heal all wounds. What heals the wounds, those wounds is, is getting them out in the light of day and cleansing them and exposing them for what they are. And so, so I try to point out to people that there are all these myths that we've bought into and, and that you might want to become familiar with them and then you can move on and start dealing with the recovery process. And the recovery process includes acceptance. It yes. includes the, the fact that we are not going to live forever that we never were. And it also includes the notion that our lives are short no matter how long we live. In, in the grand play, even if you live to be 100 and, and very few people do, that's not really a very long time. In the end, you have a few, a few memories, a, a few blinks of an eye in this mortal coil. So, but so you're asking them, of course, to do more than accept personal death. You're asking yes. people to accept the potential death of everything we love. At death of memory, the death of Beethoven and Rumi, the death of all the religions, the death of music, the death of art, the death of all animals. This is terrifying to the human. Ego. Absolutely. In the end, what you don't surrender, well, the world just strips away. I'm asking yeah. people to surrender. That's the boss, Bruce Springsteen, from many years ago. right? Yeah. So artists get it typically faster than, than us science types. And, and yes, we need to let go of some notions we have that have no basis in reality. Yes. And, and this part of our fantasy of, of specialness and unique brilliance. Absolutely. Yes. And so let's let go of, the, of, of some of those things and we will be truly liberated. Let go or be dragged. Yes. So we can either let go of some of those insane notions or we can get dragged along by them. In, in this culture of make-believe. So, how are you now? How has this truly changed your living of every moment of your life? Because I, I look at you and I see somebody who is serene and happy and funny and deeply committed to living out his life in love and service. But how has the quality of your life changed? Mine has changed totally since I've accepted this and I'd love to know what you have been experiencing? Well, you know, for me it goes back many, many years to 2002 and a long and arduous process of getting to this point, of getting to the point of acceptance again. Um, and, and it, it's an endless return, yes, isn't it? Yes, that it absolutely always is. Deeper surrenders and more and more formidable acceptances to be endured, right? Yes, absolutely. And that's a key point to be made here is that. Some days I forget. Some right. days I think that I'm I'm living on a planet where we can have infinite growth, and 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 with no adverse consequences for anybody or anything, and so I sort of forget that where I'm at, and and then I and then I go through the the, the stages of grief that we've already talked about over and over and over again. But for the most part. Acceptance is liberation. Acceptance is gratitude. I appreciate the fact that I got to be here against all odds, that I got to be here in physical form uh, near this astonishing wilderness embedded in this beautiful place on the planet. I got to be here. I got to be here with, with incredible, amazing people, some of them incredibly, horrifically bad, some of them incredibly, <laughs> horrifically good. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the Hitlers and the St. Francis's are around us, aren't right. they? Sure. And so But there's a quality that changes in life itself once you accept the possibility of near term extinction. You realize that every single moment is an opportunity for praise, for gratitude, for extending yourself beyond your comfort zone to reach out to others, to your pets, to the world itself, to offer up your gifts, because if not now, when? When yes. are you going to have the chance to dance out your life, if not on the burning dance floor of near-term extinction? Yes, absolutely. And so despite the fact that I go through all these stages again and again, and the waves roll over me and so on, for the most part, I spend a lot more of my time in, in those moments that I realize are the moments we're living for. 
that, that, that it's this moment, and then it slips away, and then it's this moment. And so I'm reminded of a story, no doubt apocryphal, about the Buddha. And the Buddha allegedly asked one of his students, how frequently do you think about death? And, and the student says, oh, very, very frequently, many times a day. And the, the Buddha says, well, that's not enough. You must think about death with every breath. <laughs> the, the, you know, the, the story, the, yes. true, or, true or not, the, the idea that life is urgent that, that we must appreciate, that we must live in gratitude for every moment is something that I realize now, that I never realized. I was always planning for the future. I was always that guy who was sucking a, a, away the money in the retirement account and, and, and talking about what's going to happen <laughs> in hundreds and thousands of years and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, and all that has been stripped away. And right. so what do we have? We have here now with, with the ones we're with. We have each other, we have the animals, we have the glory of the creation for as long as we have it, God knows how that is. We have our pets, we have our friends, we have the divine, Yes, I would, in my language. I used to be so oh. rude, you know, I'd be here with my friends and, and the phone would ring and I would talk on the phone. And, and now my, my number one rule for any human interaction is to be with the ones you're with. Yes. You know, in, instead of with the ones who are out there in the ether on Facebook and, and on the telephone and on the Skype call and so on, to be with the ones you're with. All the time to be as present as we can possibly be. I don't think you can do worse than, I don't think you can do better than that. I think you can go a step further and that's what I hope sacred activism is. I think that by facing the depths of your heartbreak at the situation, you can understand everybody else's heartbreak. And you can also turn up serving a cause with the whole of your ardor and passion, knowing that it may very well be futile, but serving it anyway out of love for humanity and out of love for God, which will render it profoundly and mysteriously transformative whatever happens. Right. And I think that is the liberated position. I'm sure that's what the Dalai Lama is living. I'm sure that anybody who comes to even the fringes of liberation tastes the freedom of giving away everything, whether or not it makes any difference. Right. And for me, for me, that God is the living planet. Yes. That, that's, that's who I serve, and that's who serves me. And, and that's where my gratitude comes from, that's where my appreciation comes from, that's where my liberation comes from. So I try to spend as much time as I can out there, but Facebook calls, you know, Facebook. <laughs> and Facebook. email. You'll, you'll be answering an email when the methane gas finally arrives. <laughs> I'm what a terrible so. thought. What would you invite people who are listening to really start reading and thinking about it this month. How, what are the key articles or books that you'd like to recommend to people, apart from Extinction Dialogues, in which you've actually, you and Carolyn, have brought together the whole adventure in a very clear and very available form. But are there any other things that you would really like people, my people, the people who are following this, to truly get to, so that they can see it as lucidly as possible? Well, thank you for saying such kind things about Extinction Dialogues, the, the subtitle for which is How to Live with Death in Mind, and I think that's important. Um, and, and I think that book provides a, a good service. The, the facts, of course, grow more horrific with every day. So since then, yeah. as I point out in a long and often updated essay at my website, um, it just gets worse every day. I updated it again today after updating it again three days ago, and, and there's just more and more evidence coming. The collapse is going at an unprecedented, an unbelievably ferocious rate, isn't it? Right, right. And they're all and the our response to it becomes ever more stupid and ever more denying. That's what's so devastating, too. Right. To live in a country where a whole party doesn't believe in global warming at the moment when. 97% of the world's scientists are absolutely out of their minds at what they're discovering is, is beyond surreal, isn't it? Well, yes, and it's, it's, it's far more um, emphatic than 97% of the scientists. It's 99.7% of the reference <laughs> journal literature. I didn't know all that. <laughs> that 99.7%. Even more wonderfully. <laughs> <laughs> ah. So, 
so there there are there are a variety of people in the stages they're at right now and so for some people they don't need any more facts and so for those people I recommend um, reading as little as possible and spending as much time as possible with the ones they're with and that includes non-human animals as well and and if you're gonna read to read poetry and to to really to do text, to read texts that can truly inspire you to go deeper into your own divine nature. What how that's my language. That's right. That's right. Yes. And so, if you if you fully accept the the evidence for near term human extinction, then you don't have to read a bunch of scientific information anymore. And that's where I am. And and pretty much every day I consider whether I should keep um, updating that often updated essay because it, I it's, think you should I think it's a um, very important service that you're doing well and I appreciate that and so that's what caused me to keep causes me to keep doing it because I go back and forth between it, it couldn't be much more clear at this point that somewhere between you know next week and and 20 years from now we're all gonna die right so uh, so some sometimes I think well, that's enough. Isn't that enough? I, I should, instead of spending the time well, it is enough because eighty percent of the world is in catastrophic denial, aren't yes. they? Yes. Yes. What you're doing is providing a way in for those people who are willing to wake up and willing to embrace the situation and willing to try and find the great treasure in the middle of this darkness. Yes, and so so I guess the point is it's enough for me and I think it's enough evidence right now for anybody willing to accept the evidence and so maybe I should spend my time doing what I tell other people to do just doing what I love. And so I tell other people to do what I do. I love tracking down every new bit of scientific information that indicates we're headed for the abyss? Not particularly. <laughs> and so I recognize that it's a service and and it 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 is consistent with my inter my inner researcher my inner scholar, and so that's why I keep doing it because so far, my my inner do what you love message hasn't overcome my inner scholar, and and I guess it's okay no matter how it comes out, for the people who have not accepted the evidence they need to to read that long essay at Nature Pets Last I think, they need to not just read the essay but click on the links to to verify Absolutely. that I'm not just making this stuff up you know no. that, that I'm actually reiterating evidence that other people are presenting I'm just organizing and putting into a package and and as I indicated there's all levels of acceptance here right and and I really really do encourage people to pursue what they love and to pursue excellence and to demonstrate the best of what we have to offer as human beings at this most amazing mom a moment in history. And so that might mean for some people not reading anymore or Absolutely. just doing their music. Or doing deep spiritual practice yes. because that's the most powerful work that you can do and then serving in, where, in the ways that you're inspired to serve. Right. Meditate 10 minutes every day, and if you don't have time for 10 minutes, meditate an hour every day. Exactly. Like Mark Twain said, I'm sorry I wrote you a 10-page letter. I didn't have time to write you a 5-page one. Right. Right. What is, what is the scientific community's reaction to the message you're giving? Because what's so moving to me about the way you write and the essays you write and of course Extinction Dialogues is how clear you are, how you constantly, constantly back what you're saying up by very potent articles from very important scientists. Mm -hmm. Yet when I talk to scientists in the environmental movement about your work, they respect you and they know that there's reality there but they're very unwilling to get behind the ferocious clarity of what you're presenting. Absolutely and so that's um, that's why uh, when I when I send messages or call on the phone to mainstream climate scientists, there's no response. So, you know, you know they well, know they're human beings. They're terrified by it themselves. They're yeah. traumatized by what they don't want to face. I imagine. Yes, it, yes. of course, absolutely. And you have to remember that almost all of these people are heterosexual ca Caucasian men, at oh. the apex of <laughs> privilege, at the apex of patriarchy. 
and, and also yes of course yes. you know and and so what i'm talking about erodes that away and so that's difficult to deal with obviously um and and I, I hear time and time and time again uh, when I do an interview with somebody, they say, you know, I've interviewed many climate change scientists or many environmental scientists, and when the, when the camera is off, when the microphone is off, they say you're right. That's But they're that's unwilling so to say true. it on the air. That's it. I remember once talking to Rupert Sheldrake, and he said, well, Scientists are very skeptical about religion until they've won the Nobel Prize, and then they can say all the spiritual intuitions that have governed their discoveries. But this is a devastating critique of the scientific community that you're really... Absolutely. Posing, as it means that these people who are guardians of scientific knowledge just don't have the courage of their own conclusions, and it takes somebody completely crazy who is willing to weather heartbreak and rejection to get the truth out. Well, yes. As you have been able to do. Look, God look, bless you. look where they work. Yes. Within a fundamentally irredeemably corrupt system. Yes. Consider, for example, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the, the vaunted yes. IPCC assessment. It's got a lot more dramatic recently, we have yes. to say. Yes. Having yes. been very conservative for a bit now, it's coming up with stuff that rings very true with your stuff, doesn't it? Yes, only with the latest assessment do they admit yes, that, the that in the absence of geoengineering, fantasy technology, in the absence of geoengineering, um, we have triggered run, runaway climate change. I love that, in the absence of geoengineering, when oh. anybody who's ever talked to anyone who understands geoengineering knows that we're playing, if we go into that, we'll be playing, we'll just speed everything up exponentially, yeah, it's, even faster. Yes, it's a prescription for absolute disaster, absolute. and we're in the midst of absolute disaster. But, uh, okay, so this is from the IPCC. Everything they put out is seven to ten years old. Ah. It's that conservative an organization. So, and, and, and science by its nature is conservative. Academic science and academic scientists are very conservative. So by the time something gets published in the refereed journal literature, it takes a while for that to happen. And then, that's the only basis for the IPCC in their assessments, is the referee journal literature. So now the information is two to four years old, and that's the entry point for them. And now they banter about it back and forth in scientific analysis, and then it p passes through political analysis before it gets released. So the information in the assessments is seven to ten years old, and the most, the most recent one is absolutely dire. Terrifying. I read it just after I read Extinction Dialogues, and I thought, my God, you two had been sitting in the same room. Yeah. But that's truly something that should have had much more impact on the world than it has. Even well, that report went almost unnoticed in between Madonna's latest boyfriend and whether or not Deflate Gate is the real <laughs> truth about the Patriots. I mean, you can't invent this society. Right. No, you're absolutely right. And, and again, I return to the, to the notion of Tim Garrett and his research, which, which now is pretty compelling and pretty complete, in pointing out that only collapse of industrial civilization prevents runaway climate change. Who's going who's gonna to run on that political campaign? Who's, what, what scientist? Well, when you point out what you pointed out, which right. is that if, if the civilization collapses, the grid collapses, 400 nuclear reactors will explode, which will be a 400 Fukushima event. Bingo. Which will annihilate the planet anyway. We're yes. in, in yes. between Schiller and Philip. It's a rock and a hard place. We have nowhere to go except deeply within. Yes, absolutely. And that's the whole take home message here. You know, we have something called the Very Large Array here in New Mexico that is a series of huge antennas constantly mining data from space because we are willing to spend so much time, money, energy effort to, to find an answer from out there when in fact as we all know the answers it's are all in here absolutely we'll, we'll spend anything to not have to go here that's the tragedy well if you you can understand why because finally to face the absolute bankruptcy of the human ego on all fronts is devastating to any human being uh, there's a story about the Buddha, you know, somebody coming to him and said, why don't you just give everybody enlightenment? 
And the Buddha said, well, you just go around the town and see who, ask people what they most want. And the guy goes around and at the end, of course, comes back to the Buddha looking very crestfallen. And the Buddha said, well, how many people actually asked for enlightenment? And the, the guy said, nobody. They asked for money or sex or power or an old age or lots of grandchildren, but nobody wants to go through the stripping and the burning and the searing and the dying of all illusion that leads to the unbelievable discovery of something in you that cannot be destroyed. Right. And those of us who've been through that process know how we went through it kicking and screaming. And it was only grace that survived, allowed us to survive. I'm speaking for myself. So I think that you and I both have tremendous compassion for people who don't want to face this, who don't want to work with this, who want to pretend that we still can go on inventing new possibilities in an impossible situation. But that our message is that although we do have compassion, they are missing something, not just about the truth of this reality, but about the truth of reality itself. Mm -hmm. That there is something that lives in us that doesn't depend upon illusion. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge door into freedom. Yeah, this idea that enlightenment is somehow a feel-good process is an absolute oh, myth. Oh, enlightenment oh, is horribly oh, destructive. It's terrible. Oh, Yes. Nobody wants that. Who would want no. that? Except that when, through grace, you struggle to the fringes of the fringes of seeing what it is, then you want nothing but it, because you know that it is peace and joy and great love, whatever happens. It is not dependent upon anything but itself, because it's like it comes from the divine, which needs nothing but itself. Right. If you survive the, your, your house burning down, Yes. You, you, you realize that there is great gratitude, great appreciation, great liberation associated with the house burning down. But at the time the that, house is burning down, nobody's a big so fan. You said that because I was thinking, I was in my bath where I get all my, hopefully, my best ideas. I was thinking, I'm dying to talk to Guy today, and I'm so happy I'm going to. And I remembered a poem by Basho, which is one of my poetry poems. It's a, it's a Japanese haiku. It goes, my house burnt down. I own a better view of the rising moon. And I, f I think that is the haiku for our time. Absolutely. That That's as wonderful. this house we've constructed out of our hubris and madness burns down, we can, if we do the work and if we go through the very painful and difficult process, come to a place where we do see the moon of something far beyond our natural understanding of the human arising in us. And that is what I would call the divine within us, what a Buddhist would call the Buddha consciousness within us. Mm -hmm. And I see it happening in all kinds of people who are facing this. There, it's not just in people like yourself or in myself. There, I meet people all the time who have truly done the work inwardly to understand the depth of the situation, who have been paralyzed and heartbroken but have come through, and who are living at a level of tenderness and compassion and service that would never have been accessible to them had they not allowed themselves to die to right. this in this death to the life beyond any death right kill the buddha destroy the ego and and i've been through that and it's a it's a horrible and wonderful thing <laughs> guy thank you so much for this conversation and i hope that it gets to everybody who who is interested in sacred activism and i just want to end by saying again how much I love this book and how f I feel that every human being should read it and can read it because it's so simply and beautifully written. And I'd like to end just by reading another paragraph from my introduction. I spent a lot of time on this introduction, so... <laughs> the fourth theme that dances like a golden thread throughout this book is that when we do accept our potentially terminal fate, an extreme love for life on its own terms and just as it is can be exploded within us, along with the radiant gratitude for the simplest things we have taken for granted and a rapture at the beauty of the world we are losing. 
When we finally face that time is running out, not just for the human race, but for all life, we can, if we choose and if we pray and meditate deeply and continue to act humbly and with unconditional love in whatever circumstances that we find ourselves in, live in peace and joy and surrender to mystery. I experience that, you experience that, hundreds of thousands of people are now experiencing that. And what we're inviting people is not to despair, but to ultimate transformation so that we can live this terrifying period with even greater determination and passion and tenderness and love. Beautiful words from a beautiful person. Thank you, Andrew. God bless you and thank you for your heroic work. I am so honored to be your friend. Thank you. God bless you.